Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. We are so excited to be joined by you. We have a great show for you tonight, and a lot of you have commented on what a great show it is. That's how great it is. So before I bring on our three guests, that's a very jam-packed panel. It's a juicy panel. Uh, before I bring on our three guests to talk about Robert Oppenheimer, the man, Oppenheimer, the movie, uh, the atomic bomb, nuclear war, nuclear energy, uh, whether the world is going to end soon, and other uplifting things. Uh, I just have to remind you guys to please hit the like button, give it the thumbs up. That's a really easy way for you to support the show. Also subscribe, hit subscribe, and then the bell. We are at over 100,000 um, subscribers and we wanna keep raising that number up even higher. It's a good way to get the word out about these important issues that we cover on the show. If you can become Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. If you're watching this show live, you're in luck. You get to see everything tonight. Um, if you're watching later and you want to see the full interview, the very um, uh, uh, detailed, rich interview, the extended interview, then to do that, go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. And uh, I'm going to bring in our three guests who I'm so excited to be bringing on. They're all making their debuts on the Katie Helper Show. So things are really looking up for them. Uh, their, their careers are going somewhere, guys. Uh, all right. So first, bringing on to the virtual stage, Leslie Bloom, an award-winning journalist, historian, and New York Times bestselling author. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, National Geographic, The Wall Street Journal, and more. And her second major nonfiction book is Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up and the reporter who revealed it to the world. Welcome, Leslie. So great to be here, Katie. Thank you for having me on. Yes, thanks for joining. And our next guest, David K. Hecht, is a historian of science focusing on the modern United States. His particular interest is in public images of science, and he has published on the phenomenon of scientific celebrities. His first book, Storytelling and Science, Rewriting Oppenheimer in the Nuclear Age, was published in 20. 2015, and he's currently researching a second book project on the intersections between nuclear and environmental history. And he is uh, the head of the history department at Bowdoin College. Welcome, David. Thanks very much. Great to be here. And contestant number three, Alex Wellerstein, is a historian of science and nuclear technology. He is a professor at the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, where he is the director of science and technology studies in the College of Arts and Letters. His first book, Restricted Data, the History of Nuclear Secrecy in the United States, is the first attempt at a comprehensive history of how nuclear weapons ushered in a new period of governmental and scientific secrecy in the USA. His current projects include a new book about Harry Truman and nuclear weapons. And you can find his writing at places like The New Yorker and The Atlantic and uh, his own blog. So let's bring on Alex. Hi, happy to be Hi. here. Thank you so much for joining. Happy to be here. So I wanted to ask, start off by asking you guys what you think the most important question, um, central question around the bomb is and how the movie handled it. I know it's a really easy one, really good icebreaker. You could also, if you wanted to, to take a, a less ambitious first question, you could also tell us how your own work intersects with this and how you started to study um, the bomb and or Oppenheimer. We're well, gonna go alphabetically. In. You go, you go first, Alex. Reverse I'll alphabet. just jump in. I mean, I think the most important question for the bomb is that people need to don't ask enough is like, what's the future of this thing, right? What is the long-term goal? What are the long-term possibilities? And what I like about the movie, I don't like everything about the movie, but one of the things I liked about the movie is it did end up making that a central question in the movie. And it wasn't just about World War II. It isn't just about the Trinity test. It isn't even just about Oppenheimer security clearance and all that. It's, it's, it's about thinking about what you're doing next and what the long term is going to do for better or worse. And that's a very hard thing for most people to do, to think more than a year or two ahead. But to think we're almost at the 80th anniversary. What will the next 80 years look like? That's the, the hard question to answer and the most interesting one for me. Well, I realized that what I should do, and this is good because I'm glad you guys are here because this is going to be very interactive. Uh, 
What I should do is set up who Oppenheimer is for people who haven't seen the movie. But luckily, I have you guys to do that for me. So I'm going to assign this uh, assignment to David because uh, you uh, are a professor. And that means you have to do this stuff all the time. So <laughs> us through who Oppenheimer is and what the central events captured by this um, Chris Nolan film are. Great. Happy, happy to do and that. And then we'll get and back to your very important okay. <laughs> intervention. Happy to do that. Um, he lived a very complicated, very public life. And I will try to do that reasonably quickly, but please feel to jump in if I, if I miss um, important parts of that, which I surely will. Um, you know, Oppenheimer um, was born in New York City in 1904, um, you know, has a kind of secular, liberal, sort of Jewish-infused education, um, goes to Harvard, graduates, and I think it's, Oh, it's early 20s. I'm, uh, he, he took a year off, so I'm blank on the exact year. Um, does his graduate work in Europe, which was very common for um, talented and ambitious theoretical physics, physicists at the time. In fact, there really was no place in the U.S. to do the kind of study that he was doing um, in mostly Germany, but Europe um, at the time. Comes back in the late 1920s and then throughout the 1930s, he's teaching in California, um, at two different places, um, California, Berkeley, and Caltech. Um, he, toward the end of the decade, he gets very involved in left-wing politics, which has um, mostly around Berkeley. Um, that becomes a really important part of his biography and later controversies around his sort of political life after World War II. Um, he becomes the, um, he's, General Leslie Groves um, assigns him to be the, uh, director of the Los Alamos um, National Labor Laboratory during World War II. This is something that may not be obvious to like a casual moviegoer, but Oppenheimer is not actually the director of the Manhattan Project. And Oppenheimer and Los Alamos is not the only site at which the Manhattan Project is taking place. It's sort of the one that is easy, easiest to mythologize, right? Mm -hmm. But there are, it is, a, it is a sprawling sort of like enterprise including um, industrial facilities in Tennessee and Eastern Washington, which are gestured at in the film, but the importance is not clear, right? You know, um, so after the war, he becomes uh, something of a public intellectual, scientific celebrity, policy advisor, um, until um, 1954, when a combination of the accelerating Cold War, changing political winds, and the McCarthy era, um, you know, combined to sort of make him persona non grata in government circles. And he, um, you know, is, has his security clearance suspended and then has a famous or infamous security hearing in 1954 in which um, his life is sort of like, you know, probed to a very sort of meticulous extent and the security clearance is upheld and he never works um, for the government again. Um, and then there's a lot of mythologizing of various kinds that happens in journalism and novels and mythology and opera right so, right um, yeah thereafter. so and we'll get right. into why he's such a compelling figure which yeah. is something you yourself obviously have questioned yeah. um and leslie how did your own work uh intersect with oppenheimer the figure well i, I documented the aftermath of uh, Hiroshima and how that was presented to to the American public and to an international community. So you know, if if Nolan was looking at you know the the genesis of of you know Oppenheimer's mega weapon, I was looking at its effect on human beings, which is really something that's completely ignored in the film. I'm sure there are very you know strong creative reasons. I'm sure he's interviewed about that, um, but it's something I'd love to unpack with this crew because I want to know everybody's feelings are on that creative decision. Um, so that's. That's how I came to Oppenheimer. I actually spent, you know, to, to, to David's point, um, I spent more time with Leslie Groves than Oppenheimer in this in this process. And uh, I was I was pretty surprised actually that Groves wasn't a bigger a figure in the movie uh, because he's really, you know, the, the machine in many ways in terms of getting the bomb ready for wartime use and doing so in a very qualm free sort of way and never had qualms about it, you know, looking yeah. back as well. Um, so, you know, Groves and, and Oppenheimer are interesting in their interplay. Um, so I felt that in a way that was a bit of a missed opportunity, but certainly not one that the three of us have missed in our scholarship. Right. Um, and what do you think, we're going to get into the future of, of the bomb, especially because, uh, Alex, you, you find that to be the most exciting. But even if you hadn't brought that up, 
I think that's obviously, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'll, I'll just, I'm not going to go through the historical cliches about the past and future and present. But before we get into that, what do you think um, the film gets right, uh, gets wrong? And then we can go into like what it leaves out, but it isn't necessarily incorrect about. So what, what do you, what do you credit it for getting right? And then getting, and then what do you judge it for getting wrong? Is, is this I for defer, everybody? I defer or? To, yeah. yeah, I defer <laughs> to you guys. To, yeah, in terms of in terms of the Oppenheimer Oppenheimer bio, I I mean we're not civilians watching the film, you know. I mean, so our our nitty gritty is going to be pretty intense. Um, but I, I mean, you guys, if, if you don't mind talking about the bio, I have things about you know the representation of the bomb itself and its aftermath. Yeah, I Worth mean, wh when I, it, it's hard to to like, what does it get right? It gets a lot of things right. It it actually surprised me because I went in with extremely low expectations because my <laughs> feeling, and I wonder if David felt similarly, when I heard that Nolan was making an Oppenheimer biopic, I thought, oh, it's going to be really bad because like the appeal of Oppenheimer to a filmmaker is usually really superficial. And in most films that feature an Oppenheimer as a character, I'm not impressed because they love to make him a relatable everyman or they make him, a, you know, a, a friend of all. And, and like, this is not the guy, right? Like he is a much more complicated figure than that. And even with the Cold War downfall stuff, it's usually about like poor Oppenheimer, just the victim of his times or something. And it's he's he's more complicated than that. And 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 even he often gets cast as this kind of like dove and he's not a dove right at all and so i was going in thinking he's gonna be so tempted by those existing narratives and i was really surprised because like that isn't really the story he's trying to tell i'm not sure i 100 percent am inside nolan's brain about what the story he is trying to tell but it's not that oppenheimer it's a different oppenheimer and cillian murphy's take on him is not as uh, one-dimensional as it looked in some of the trailers, which I appreciate it. So what I like about it, the, in terms of general getting right, it's an interpretation of Oppenheimer that feels plausible enough. I don't know if there is a right interpretation of Oppenheimer and like what motivates him and drives him. Uh, historians can argue about this forever and they all do. But like, it's a plausible interpretation. It's not my Oppenheimer, but it's an Oppenheimer that feels real enough and some of the issues about like Oppenheimer's problems with identity that I thought I was is subtle and he did a good job of that in terms of getting stuff wrong like you can go through the list of lots of little errors lots of big framing errors lots of errors that you can tell they made because of like time constraints and narrative constraints yeah. like it's a long list but yeah. I don't know how much I want to hold him. I, I don't want to do the Neil deGrasse Tyson thing and be sure. like, uh, uh the hat was a different color, right? Like right. that's not interesting. Um, <laughs> the biggest thing for me about what they got wrong. And this is again, a narrative choice for sure. They compress the period between 1945 and 1949 into basically nothing. And that's in the service of both moving the plot to the H bomb stuff and the Soviets setting off a bomb and all that. But it's also in the service of like a narrative that's about Oppenheimer getting sidelined. And that's not the reality of it. Like 45 to 49, he's at his peak powers. His, the, the guy running the AEC is not Louis Strauss. It's a different guy who they cut out of the movie, which I get it. It's fine. But the guy they cut out, David Lilienthal, he's a friend of Oppenheimer's, right? Like Oppenheimer is in a really important place in those years and to cut those years in particular feeds a really wrong narrative about like both the role of science and and the bomb and policy, but Oppenheimer in particular. It misses the real ascent before the crash. And so that was the biggest for me historical problem I had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And should I just yeah. And in, yeah, yeah. So in I mean, I agree with all of that. Um what I what I liked, I mean, I'm glad you asked like what we liked because it's so easy to like go right into you know what i liked i thought that on at least two big questions there's at least a nod towards some kind of complexity right so the ethical issues i think that it's really easy to think about the ethical questions about that are as concentrating solely on the question of should the bomb have been dropped or not Right. Whereas, and not that that's unimportant, but I think that 
he does a pretty good job showing that there are ethical questions throughout, right? From, the, from people's decisions to work on the project to the debates about what to do with it to the post-war arms buildup, that it's not, and that those weren't something that appear out of nowhere in August 1945 and then di disappear again. That that's part of just how science and the military are just sort of like jockeying position, just like always. So I like that. Similarly, I like the fact that the 1954 security hearing doesn't come out of nowhere, right? It's not just, I mean, Alex, you sort of alluded to this, right? It's not just like, oh, it's McCarthyism now. And so somebody with Oppenheimer's past is um, suspect. There's certainly, that's true, but there is a much, much longer detailed history of Oppenheimer's various activities and sort of, um, you know, run-ins with security officials. And, um, you know, I think it portrays that pretty well. So and I'll, I'll get, I'll, I'll stop there. So, yeah. yeah. And uh, Leslie, you wanted to focus on other questions, right? Cause I have more questions. So do you want me, do you want to answer that? Or do you want me to shift? No, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll take, I'll take a crack at it. I'll okay, say, look, I mean, my, my big, my big line about the film is, you know, whatever you think about it and, you know, whatever nuclear historians or physicists or whatever, you know, when we're, when we're picking it apart and looking at, you know, the, the depictions, whether they're right or wrong. Oppenheimer, you know, nearly a billion dollars in the international uh, gross right now. Many million people have seen it. A lot of the issues that this movie um, have brought up are things that, you know, Alex and, and uh, David and I have been screaming into the wind about, and now everybody is talking about these nuclear issues. And so Oppenheimer, the movie has, in my opinion, has done a, a great service to bringing up what many people in, you know, the nuclear watchdog landscape call the forgotten existential threat. Yeah. So bravo to that. Um, you know, most of my my um, quibbles, if you want to call them that politely with the film, again, have to do more with omissions rather than, than right. depictions. And, you know, as we, we touched on, you know, earlier, you know, the, the lack of aftermath, um, you know, which we, we have other authors and filmmakers to, to rely on to show us that and hopefully more of that in the future, because a whole new generation really needs to be reminded of how ghastly the, the effects of these mega weapons are. Um, I would say, you know, this is this might be eccentric of me. Um, and maybe it's because I'm in Los Angeles, um, but I would say that I was actually really quite underwhelmed by the depiction of the bomb itself in uh, in the movie. Um, and and it, that sounds small minded of me, but I think it actually does quite a disservice because what we're trying to do is we're trying to depict the enormous history changing magnitude of, of these weapons. This was man's ability to destroy civilization. And as the movie points out, you know, rather excessively, in my opinion, um, you know, possibly instantaneously ignite the, the atmosphere, but then it, the actual bomb is, it, it's, it looks a bit dinky. Um, you know, and I, I have pulled, you know, several descriptions from eyewitnesses where they are talking about what it was actually like to be in the presence of that bomb. And it was a biblical experience. And I just think if there was ever, you know, a, a moment to use CGI, um, you know, this, this might have been it. We could have seen, you know, this bomb from space. They saw it in, in at least four states and two countries. And, and, and so I, I think that that, that was an, an, an odd choice that in a way undercut the um the gravity the gravity of of what had been brought forth by Oppenheimer and his team. I'm, and, I'm really really glad you said that, Leslie. Just because. And just to clarify, had, this is just I just want to clarify. This is yeah. the, the we don't see the bombing in Hiroshima. No, no, no. It's just no, no, no. I'm talking about the Trinity well, I know, detonation. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm not clarifying for you guys. I mean, for the <laughs> audience, for people who haven't seen this, um, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, Host explaining to any of you guys. But, <laughs> I just want to. I just want to quickly just say I'm so glad Leslie brought up the how unimpressive Trinity was in the film because I feel like when I bring it up, it makes me sound really ghastly as like a nuke guy. Right. But when Leslie brings it up, it feels I'm like yes, it's true. <laughs> as the, the not just guys can not be impressed by this nuke, but it, yeah, it was. It's yeah. like obviously a conventional weapon. It does not have the right sense. A conventional explosive. It does not have the right sense of scale in Nolan's version of it at all. It's not inspiring. You don't want to quote poetry you know you're just like okay 
very disappointing. But, but, but just, you know, Alex, just to pick up on what you're saying, though, I mean, the, the reason why that's important is that, you know, the immediate aftermath of, of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the U.S. government, you know, they're downplaying the, the radioactive aspects of the, of the bomb. And, you know, so what they're really doing in a lot of ways is they're, they're, they're acknowledging that it's an atomic weapon and that it's new and, and all powerful, but they're also still casting it in conventional terms. And so they're in many ways encouraging the American public to think of it as a conventional mega weapon. It's, you know, 20,000 tons of TNT, that sort of thing. And what that does is it, it, it undercuts, again, the extremity of, of what this, this weapon is and, and, and also undercutting the fact that this is the weapon that goes on killing long after detonation. And so in, it's it's a, it's a bit eerie and ironic to see this this recreation of the bomb today when we have all of the technical ability to make this really look like the mega weapon that it was, um, and and then not not use that. Yeah, why do you think they made that choice? Like I said, I'm sure Chris Nolan in one of his gazillion interviews has talked about that decision and has been told about it. If, if, if he has talked about it, I haven't come across it yet. Yeah. But if I do get, you know, the fortune of interviewing him soon, then I yeah. would, Chris, would put it Chris, if you're watching, come on. He, yeah, he, come on. He's, I heard him say at a, at a screening that, that he, he's, he doesn't like CGI. He <laughs> makes a sort of a fetish of not using CGI. He felt like doing the authentic was better. And like, I, on the one hand, I hear you. But like you can't replicate the scale and your brain is smart 100%. enough to know this. Like there's things in that explosion. This is kind of technical. We're like little bits of like spark of flaming stuff is going out. And your brain is smart enough to know that like that's too small. Right. That's too big for this to be an atomic bomb. Right. Like it's not moving at the right speed as an explosion. It's the wrong color. It's it it, it feels just very fake. And here's the thing you don't have to actually fake it by setting off explosives. Like the movie, the day after from 1983 does a perfectly, I mean, imagine if you did that, they use like liquid, they don't have CGI. They're doing some kind of liquid simulation type thing. And it looks pretty eerie and weird with like conventional compositing. Imagine if you did that today without CG, you'd think you could do better than what they did, which was set off some kind of explosive and then say, probably scale it or something, but it just doesn't feel right. You know, it's interesting. I'm thinking of this alongside the moment in the film where they, know, they don't show Hiroshima, right? As you mentioned, what they show is the scientists' reactions to seeing the images. And in a, in a way, intentionally or not, the moment of Trinity in the film is doing something similar. Because even though you see the explosion, no one is trying to use the reactions and the, the experience of the scientists and other staff members and their reactions to carry the emotional weight yeah. of it, right? In the same way that he's trying to do that for, um, for Hiroshima. So there's that continuity there that like his interest seems to be in like the people who did it yeah. and less the effects or the scale. Right. Yeah. You know, see, but even, even that, like the reactions that he's depicting, there were more, I mean, again, from eyewitnesses who were there, they were more extreme. People were yeah, crying, they were true. throwing up. I mean, right. they, they knew, yeah. um, you know, what, what they, they were witnessing. And um, so I just, it, it's, again, it just seemed to, it, it's the climax of the yeah. entire movie and it's the birth of the nuclear age. And, you know, so these, these, the decisions that are supposedly geared towards authenticity are anything but, which is yeah. ironic. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah, you know, and not to not to sound totally snotty, but I just you know I went back after you know seeing Oppenheimer you know a couple of times and just to to confirm that that the 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 bomb had looked that way in the movie, and then I was like, hmm, where else have I recently seen a nuclear bomb in uh, Indiana Jones film? And I went back and I watched Indiana. It was at Crystal Skull, and you know Indiana Jones is in Nevada, you know, in, yeah, as they were doing a test and. The Indiana Jones bomb looked more like a nuclear bomb than than, than the Chris Chris Nolan's Trinity bomb. Uh, so you know that Hollywood can do it when they when they want to. And you know, again, just this is from an eyewitness account. This is you know one reporter, the sole reporter who was there. He said, you know, there rose from the bowels of the earth a light not of this world. You know, it was a sunrise such as the world had never seen. A great green super sun climbing to a height of more than eight thousand feet. You ain't getting that in Nolan's film. 
Mm. You can't do that with a conventional explosive. And I just mm. throw this out again. Like there are like scale differences that are significant. And if you want to fake a nuclear bomb, there's ways to fake it, but you can't fake it by setting off something conventional. Like they don't, they're not going to, mm. you're not going to get the atmospheric phenomena. There's a difference in tens of thousands of tons to like a ton. It's, it's just not the same thing. So the film makes a very deliberate choice to not even try to capture what happens in Hiroshima. Um, what do you guys think, uh, what do you think it's important for people to know about what happened there? And then what about, and you especially can speak to this, Leslie, but what about the things that happened to the downwinders? I mean, look, we, we see in the film, the only, the only thing we see in the film in terms of the, the bomb's impact on humans um, is, you know, Oppenheimer is addressing an audience of his workers at Los Alamos, and he's having a couple of uh, uh, vivid visions of, you know, a woman's skin flicking away, and, um, you know, a char, like, almost like an indecipherable charred object. And, um, fine, that's, those are really, like, the lightest butterfly touches of hints of what these bombs did, and, um, you know, I had the the gruesome privilege of documenting what the after effects were, you know, what the actual, what it was like to be on the receiving ends of Oppenheimer's deadly toys, you know, Sting calls it. Um, and it's no matter how many times and gifted people and eyewitnesses have described it, it's indescribable. Um, and, you know, so I, you know, in, in, in my book, I document uh, John Hersey was a New Yorker uh, war correspondent who went into Hiroshima a year later and interviewed, you know, scores of, of survivors about their experience of, of Hiroshima and created a, a harrowing account of, of the day and the, of the moment and the days following the bombing of Hiroshima. I mean, really, once you read it, you'll, you'll never never forget the descriptions of, of you know these young families um reduced to you know the, just the most horrific state um i will say that honestly the 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 testimonies that most impacted me as a researcher of hiroshima um it was not hersey's uh survivors accounts but they were actually um accounts that appeared later that were written by surviving japanese doctors um who either you know ha had been in hiroshima the day of or were imported from tokyo or other places in the following days and i will spare your um your listeners and and, and audience the descriptions from from those books and those testimonies but again it's just it, it, knowing knowing the impact is intimately as I do, it makes the decision to avoid it entirely in Oppenheimer um, seem curious at best, um, or, you know, and also just a really uh, carelessly gross decision at worst. Mm. So there's to a me. Oh, sorry, were you? There's no, a I just said to me. Yeah, yeah, okay. There's a line when toward the end of the film, when Louis Strauss's character, um, by the way, I felt thought Robert Downey Jr. was a great casting choice yeah. for that. Unexpected to me, but I thought it was great. Um, he's sort of like finally sort of like recognizing, right, that like he's not, he's sort of, his demeanor, he, he's losing his cool finally a bit. And he is starting to rail against Oppenheimer a bit. Um, and he says, I don't remember the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of Oppenheimer wants credit for Trinity the scientific right. achievement, but not blame for Hiroshima, yeah. right? And I hadn't quite thought of this until you were talking, Leslie, but it seems that that's also the story Nolan wants to tell, right? You know, he wants to tell the Oppenheimer mm -hmm. story, not really the atomic bomb story, right? And obviously those are deeply connected and overlapping, but they're not exactly the same thing. Right. You know, and I think the loyalty is to the Oppenheimer story and that either allows him or nudges him away from, for better, I'm not saying this is a good thing necessarily, right, away from some of the issues that you're bringing up. Mm. Leslie, so, yeah. It's yeah, definitely I, I, a stylistic choice. I mean, he's yeah. very clear that like it's 
it's all from Oppenheimer's point of view, unless it's from essentially Straws's, which is all in black and white. Right. Apparently, I haven't seen it yet. My copy's in the mail, but apparently he wrote the script from the entirely the first person. Like, yeah. like it's which is really a weird, right? But like that show, and I agree that like there's there's real ups and downs to doing it that way, right? There's a lot that's missed. Anything that is not an Oppenheimer's line of sight is not in the film, which is includes Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Downwinders, uh, you know, uh, uh, the rest of the Manhattan Project, yeah. right? Like, like it, it narrows the vision. And I can see the argument for that as art. I can also see the real like, hey, you're kind of, you're missing out on a lot when you do that. And I, what, I I agree wholeheartedly with but with both you guys and you know and and in in the many interviews that I've done in the af, you know in the aftermath of the film's release you you want to acknowledge this this is a biopic and mm -hmm. as we all know with any with any book with any film any any creative project you have to narrow the prism no book can tell can tell everything but your vicious the, editor told you Leslie as I've heard you say in interviews <laughs> <laughs> my wicked and cruel editor yes who made me basically cut half of my book out. Um, but it, it, it's the problem is, is that, you know, just because, you know, you're narrowing to Oppenheimer's point of view, the fact it, his, his weapon created enormous pain for, you know, many tens of thousands of people and, and, and agonizing death and you can't extricate them. You just can't. And, and so just like, you know, it, it, they, those issues were certainly not just in Oppenheimer's peripheral vision. This was like, he changed the world. I mean, Chris Nolan's big line about Oppenheimer is he's the most important man who ever lived. And there's the asterisk that says I'm the second most important for bringing him to everybody's attention again, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, but I, it just, the, those, those issues, they, they just, they can't, they can't be extricated. I mean, the, the sanitizing, the, the compartmentalization is really, I hate this word, but I'm going to use it. Problematic. Yeah, I knew, I knew that was coming. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, you knew it was coming. You saw no, it. No, but it has, it has to be. I mean, there's like the, uh, something that you wrote, Alex, in a forthcoming piece of yours that's coming out in the LA Review of Books. You wrote, the visions that kept Oppenheimer up at night were not about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for better or worse. They were about the next war, the one he hoped Hiroshima and Nagasaki would make impossible. So I want to ask you all about this kind of ethical question. Because I think for a lot of people watching the film, obviously it is about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it did seem like there was a bit of goal uh, post moving. Uh, so it seems like from the movie, the narrative is we need to develop this because if we don't do this, the Nazis will. Then the Nazis, you know, Hitler uh, commits suicide and now it's a different justification and it becomes something that it wasn't originally. What do you think, uh, so, so what happened? And, and what do you think the film is arguing happened? And what do you individually think happened? Well, like I mean, one of the issues with the film, and I agree this is a problem with it, is it doesn't show that happen. And there's, it's actually a little surprising because there's some nice drama that they could have, included about that fact that that happens and they don't really do that they have one little discussion with scientists at los alamos that oppenheimer kind of quiets them all down but they don't have a, a joseph rotblatt character jo joseph rotblatt was a polish scientist who quit the project at that point very pointedly because he said i got into this to stop nazis not right. to kill japanese and like that's I'm surprised based on all the cast they put in and, and the sort of minor characters, they couldn't throw a Joseph Rotblatt in there somewhere. But like, I was a little surprised because that struck me as the kind of thing that would appeal to this kind of story. It, it, so they just, they just make that segue without really mentioning it. I think that in reality, it's pretty complicated historically. So like, it's clear that some of the people at the beginning of the Manhattan project did care about the Germans uh, and that was sort of a justification, though, even then, by the time you get to the phase of the army being involved, the Germans are not really the primary consideration. They aren't really talking. They're, they want to, like, keep an eye on the Germans, but that's not the same driver as it was to the refugee scientists in, say, 1939, right. 1940. And... Uh, uh, Groves would later go on to tell Truman and that the target was always the Japanese, which is a little mm -hmm. overstating it. But it's not totally wrong in that they were not really think they weren't planning. They made no plans to use it on Germany. They didn't have it ready to go, but it just wasn't even like on the radar. 
like the earliest target meeting they have is in 43 and they say now nah, we'll drop it on the japanese and you're like wait what and it's still very informal at this stage mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. uh in terms of worrying about the germans over the course of like 1944 they go from thinking they probably don't have any weapons to they definitely don't have any weapons. And so the Germans just drop out of the picture right as they start getting towards needing to plan for actually using a bomb. And so the segue to Japan, uh, even Roosevelt, one of the few, th Roosevelt himself doesn't commit to record or even tell people almost anything about what any plans to use the bomb. He's very difficult to get inside his head in retrospect. Um, even he only, I think it's only two occasions, talks about using it. Once as he agrees with, Churchill in like 43 that if they have a bomb they might use it against the Japanese nothing about the Germans and then in December 44 he asks Groves to the White House and asks Groves if they might have one ready to use on Germany and Groves says no and he says okay that's it right but like even he that's the, and that's the closest you get to a German discussion is in, in, in Roosevelt in 44 and it's impossible anyway my point is just like it's pretty interesting issue that it doesn't really come up and in terms of like did they really care about the germans i think it depends on who you talk about uh, in it but it is sort of a subtle thing like most of the people on the project don't really notice that shift mm -hmm. they start they a lot of the scientists thought that they were building a preventative weapon and then up with a city destroying first strike weapon and they don't sit back except for some of the people at Chicago, which is shown in the movie a little bit, Zillard. Right. right. Um, but that's, that's my understanding of the actual history of it. It's a sl sort of a smooth slide without too many people wanting to bring up that it's sliding. I would add that at the end of the war and Alex and, and David, I'd be, you know, I would want to know if your scholarship backs this also that, um, people involved in the project and people like Einstein, they're not just, you know, the, the consideration isn't just are we going to drop it on the Germans or the Japanese, knowing that it's going to be the Japanese, but they're also looking to the future, you know, like, what does this portend for civilization? And so they are thinking about, you know, the next war. And um, uh, because they're already in a cycle in the first half of the 20th century of forever world wars, you know, I mean, we've already had two mega wars. And then, you know, we have that great quote from uh, a terrifying quote from Albert Einstein, which doesn't come till after the war, admittedly, but he says, you know, I don't know, um, I can't tell you how we're going to fight the third world war implication nukes but i can tell you how we'll fight the fourth one we'll, it will be using rocks and so you know they're they they are you know keenly aware again of the civilization destroying possible potential in the weapons that they're creating so i feel like that's weighing heavily on the minds of some of them at least it's especially on the the, the phys physician not the physicist but the physician side of the med right i mean one of the things that strikes me is that, and I agree, agree with everything you both have said, but is that, is that thinking about the kind of world destroying potential of these weapons, which doesn't, they don't really go from, I mean, I mean, they go from like awful to unimaginably awful really in the fifties with thermonuclear weapons, yeah. right? I mean, like, I mean, I, I don't want, any way want to downplay what's happening with the, the, the kind of first generation of atomic weapons, but those are, you know, horrific weapons, but not like, not genocidal, right? In the same way that they become later. But certainly people are cognizant that it's going that way. But one of the interesting things to me about that realization, and I think you're absolutely right, it happens, you know, before the war, right, end of the war, and then, you know, is that that realization doesn't necessarily lead predictably to any one policy advocacy, right? So it is possible to be a Los Alamos scientist, to look at what you've done, to have had that kind of soul-shaking experience of Trinity and go, we need arms control, right? You know, we, you know, but it is also possible, you know, to be a scientist who worked in the project and perhaps reluctantly agree with some of the more conservative takes in the policy arena and go, we need more of these than anyone else and fast, right? So I think historically it's really easy and perhaps a little comforting to focus on the, the Einsteins, right. to some extent the Oppenheimers, the people who founded the Bolton the Atomic Scientists who are like, who are putting these ethical issues front and center. But there were plenty of people, certainly by the late 40s, and even like early on, 
who were like not really voicing those ethical issues in quite the same way. And I've sort of lost my exact connection to sort of your, your, your question, but that is one of the things that sort of like strikes me about, you know, that reaction is that like for everyone who is, we have a record of them voicing the ethical concerns, there are probably at least as many who are either not having them or staying private about those those mm. concerns or being public about them you know you know, and, and, yeah. you know so when i'm looking at general leslie rose he's like repurposing repurposing john hersey's agonizing reveal about um you know the the effects of, of atomic weapons i mean he green lighted it it was censored by him and he green lighted it to come into publication because he felt not that it would um create a backlash against building out the nuclear arsenal but because he said as you said the the, the future is atomic we're not going to have the nuclear monopoly forever so we need the biggest and the best and the most and so he felt that somebody if like you know hersey's story which shows you know young young families and young doctors and 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 a young clerk you know being on the receiving end of nuclear warfare he felt that people reading that might not just you know have sympathy for them but they might see themselves in that and 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 recognize the need to build up a defensive nuclear arsenal you know and 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 uh you know so it's fascinating to see that you know people who had no ethical qualms whatsoever from the beginning to the end about building and using nuclear weapons were willing to use what uh, um materials of conscience uh to to bring them around for to to rally uh, rally support for for uh, accelerated nuclear programs. Can you talk about the Frank report and its um, representation in the film? The sure, yeah. yeah. So the Frank report was a report at the University of Chicago by a committee. So one thing that doesn't it comes out a little bit in the film, but I'll just say it here. But so University of Chicago is another one of these big research sites for the Manhattan Project. It's where they made the first nuclear reactor. And their main job was to design the reactors that would be made at Hanford to make plutonium. And then after they sort of finished that, essentially, if a scientist was considered very like politically reliable, they might send them to Los Alamos. But if they were considered politically suspicious or annoying to General Groves, who like loathed Leo Zillard, for example, and, and planned to potentially lock him up without any rights for the duration of the war, uh, actually wrote out the order for it, but it wasn't granted. Um, they kept him at Chicago as sort of like a holding pen. And it's like, well, you're still in the project, but you're not in the heart of things. So this is where you get a lot of people who are willing to sort of sit back and say, huh, what's the future going to be? And so they write a lot of different reports in this period in 44 to 45, where they're like, what should the future be? And not all of it's big ethical stuff. Some of it's like, what should future research look like? What should the arrangement of money look like? I don't know. What are the possibilities for P? You know, all sorts of things. And so one of the reports that gets written is under the uh, a committee chaired by James Frank, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics. He was a German refugee. He had actually been involved in chemical warfare in World War I under Otto Hahn. So he's pretty like respected and connected and those things. They It was a committee on social and political uh, responsibilities and, and implications of the bomb. And it basically says, look, if we use this bomb first on a city with no warning, things are going to get rough in the world, right? Like things won't go in our favor. Nobody's going to trust us. People are going to think we, the, one of the lines they actually crossed out in the final one was people might think we are a nascent Germany, right? Like not positive stuff. And so they recommend not using the weapon um, on a city without warning first, maybe a demonstration, maybe a big warning, you know, give the Japanese a chance not to have this happen. And this also manifests as a, as a petition that Zillard circulates. And this is sort of what's shown in the movie is basically Zillard trying to influence Oppenheimer and others, including Teller, into saying publicly, we don't want to use this on a city without warning. If it, And they would rather not use it at all, but they recognize that that's not a great compelling argument. So instead, they're sort of saying, set it off somewhere where you tell the Japanese where it's going to be, go look over there, and then you blow it up and you say, okay, ready to surrender. And if they don't, maybe then you drop it on a city now that they know what's in, but dropping it without warning, they think is sort of a, a, a bad idea. And they frame it mostly in sort of like geopolitical terms, not like moral terms. So that's the Frank report. And that's that. And they do include that a little in the movie. They don't really 
do that much with it. They have a little bit of discussion at Los Alamos. That's fine. And then uh, uh, they they have Oppenheimer uh, in the one meeting that's meant to be him trying to present positions to the, the government, the, what's called the interim committee, the Secretary of War Stimson. They have him sort of address this because he was on a panel of scientists who were asked, could you do a demonstration shot? And they don't even really... I thought that they actually did this not that great because Oppenheimer is the one who essentially signs off on using the bomb without any warning. And I, I think that's an important aspect of understanding him. Again, he is not trying to avoid using this bomb on cities. He's very much, for various reasons, wants to use it on a city. Uh, and uh, But they, they sort of underplay that in the film, I thought, a little bit. Mm. And another ethical, oh, David, do you want to, yeah. another ethical issue is the claim that this had to be done because without this, they would have had to have fought, continue fighting with Japan and lives would have been lost. So there's this harm reduction argument that's made also. And the film seems to debunk that a little bit. Could you guys comment on that? And don't go Thanks anywhere, for, guys, for watching. Because we have one more guest for you. And thank you so much to David, Alex, and Leslie. That was amazing. And if you guys uh, are watching this now, you're so in luck because you get to see that whole uh, chat. And if you're watching it later to see that full chat, go to patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. But we have one more guest that we're bringing on to the show. She's going to talk about a bunch of different things. In fact, we're going to start with the transition. We're going to ask her about Barbie. So I'm bringing back onto the, the Katie Helper Show stage uh, someone who you know, you love, Jamie Peck. Hi, Jamie. Hello. How's it going? Good. You? Oh, my God. I'm so tired. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say, I'm feeling so pumped to be here. I feel great. No, I'm very pumped to be here or I definitely wouldn't be doing it. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I am extremely yeah. tired right now sorry too honest i feel like no no, no. it's good that's why people very, uh, uh, trust, that's why people trust this program and and guests like you yeah um so uh jamie you are here you are uh i don't even know what do i introduce you as these days well it's a bit of a gray area it's up to you how do you 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 tell me podcaster, podcaster. writer podcast writer organizer okay, podcaster writer organizer brand, <laughs> brand you said friend Oh, friend. Yeah. Podcaster, writer, yeah, or um, friend. I wear many hats. Yeah, mom. Yeah. Um, and you're doing a lot of organizing around um, Stop Cop City. That is true. Uh, all, Brad put overall awesome person. Um, we'll take it. Before we get into Cop City, and also you are hosting a show that is happening this weekend, which I'm very excited about. And yeah. depending on my travel commitments, um, I may or may not be there, but I endorse it either regardless of whether I'm on that stage. But before you get into that stuff quickly, oh, there it is. Look okay. at us. Uh, what were your thoughts uh, on Barbie? It was a great piece of bourgeois feminist entertainment. That's basically in a nutshell, right? Yes. <laughs> like, I mean that sincerely. Yeah. Like, yeah. I enjoyed it. I found it entertaining. And the politics were, like, pretty lib. And when they tried to get a little heavy handed with them, sometimes it was cringe. But all in all, I enjoyed it, you know? Yeah, I like it. Um, that was a great description. So you'll have to come back to tell us about your take on Oppie, on Oppenheimer. But um, tell us about uh, Cop City and then tell us about this show. Oh, boy. I want to talk about, honestly. Sure. So um, I actually just got out of a meeting just now um, with the Stop Cop City folks. Um, I guess I should back up a little bit and say, you know, I initially went down there to Atlanta as a journalist, but also as, you know, someone who knows people who are involved. And uh, I hadn't been organizing much of anything for a little while. I was kind of burned out on it. All I was doing was polyed. Um, that's political education. For people not in the know, not um, polyamorous education. More, more than one thing. person has thought uh, that I was like teaching DSA people how to be, how to be polyamorous, polyamorous, which is very funny. Um, but no, 
Uh, I I had been sort of lacking for an organizing project to stick my teeth into. And, you know, I went to this thing. I covered it a bit. I did a podcast about it. I did a segment for Means TV. But, you know, saw very quickly that these people are for real. And I joined them. So now I am uh, regretting regretting it every second of every day. No, just kidding. It's a lot of work, though. Um, <laughs> so what is Cop City for people who don't know? What's going? Okay, I'll back up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Cop City is a giant police training facility that they are trying to build where the Atlanta forest currently is. Um, and this is the largest forest of any major city in the country. It's very ecologically important for the air quality in the city um, to, for, to make sure flooding doesn't get even worse. Um, you know, it's a nice green space. It's in a black working class neighborhood. People's kids play there. Um, they're trying to cut down these trees and build a giant mock city for the cops to practice killing people in. Um, there's a lot of different things that are supposed to go on that spot. Uh, but that includes what is essentially a mock black neighborhood complete with a club and a gas station and, you know, all the places that cops usually interact with civilians in, you know, only only the friendliest of ways, I'm sure. Um, but no, this is a basically a police militarization facility where they are going to practice using military technology, you know, robot dogs, all kinds of fucked up shit. We don't even know they have probably to put down the next George Floyd uprising or any kind of urban insurrection scenario. And it's going to train cops from all over the country and even places as far flung as Israel. And they've already killed a protester. Yes, they um, they killed Tortuguita. Manuel Tehran was their uh, real name. Tortuguita was their forest name. Uh, that is something that is still being investigated. Uh, very bad. Very sad. I was act, but, uh, you know, Tort's mom and brother have since joined the movement and I was hanging out with them the last time I was down in Atlanta and uh, they are, you know, they they're keeping up the fight. They're carrying on the fight that, uh, you know, Tort first started. And I, I don't think that we can um, I don't think we should send the cops the message that killing somebody works. So we really need to just go that much harder now. Um, but in addition to uh, killing a, a peaceful protester who was sitting cross-legged on the ground in their tent, um, riddled with something like 40 bullet holes um, in a multi-agency raid, uh, it's hard to know what actually happened there. It's possible that the cops just all like freaked each other out. Like, you know, they like horses, horses with guns. They get startled and they freak out. Um, but uh, they have also arrested over 40 people now are facing these ridiculous domestic terrorism charges just for being there. Um, obviously, these are not legitimate, and I don't think they're going to hold up in court, but it is still a scary thing to have happen. They have also beaten a number of people very badly, um, such as during the raid on the music festival during the second to last week of action in Atlanta, where they just started um, snatching people up and charging them with terrorism for being there. Um, they beat some people really badly. Um, even one guy to the point where they didn't even arrest him afterwards. They just let his friends take him to the hospital. So yeah, that's what we're dealing with on, uh, the, the repression side of things. Wow. Uh, and anything new happening, any announcements that you want to make? Also, I would love to have Tor Tort's relatives on the show. Yeah, they're great. Um, uh, you should. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff happening. So, one thing, one arm of this very multi-dimensional movement composed of many different groups and individuals is uh, a referendum. So I am actually really impressed that they managed to get all these signatures. Um, the campaign to get a referendum on the ballot to let the people of Atlanta decide if they want this thing built or not. You know, spoiler alert, they don't. But uh Actually, the people who live in the neighborhood right by there where they're trying to build it um, can't even vote in Atlanta. They're not like eligible to uh, sign the petition like when I was 
canvassing for the petition. They had to have an Atlanta address because it's technically outside of city limits. So that's, you know, partly by the design, right? Because uh, city council is not uh, in any way uh, responsible to these people, but uh, people in the rest of Atlanta also don't want it, I promise. Um, and we know that because over 100,000 people so far have signed the petition to get the referendum on the ballot to let people vote uh, on Cop City. And uh, that is actually twice the number of people who voted for Mayor Andre Dickens in the last election. So um, that's cool. I mean, speaking anecdotally, I uh, talked to a lot of people outside the Kroger when I was there canvassing one day, and uh, most people, most of the people I talked to were against it. Nobody was for it. They were either like excited to sign the thing, or they're like, "I don't want to talk right now. I'm shopping for groceries," which you know, fair enough. Um, but that is, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm looking at the comments. Sorry, right. just... Sparky wrote, "Cop used to protect and serve citizens. Now they view citizens as enemy combatants." true uh they do um so the referendum uh the city is you know obviously trying every dirty trick in the book to try and stop it um they are actually using a voter suppression tactic called signature verification where you know if the computer doesn't think that the signature you used on the petition matches the one you used on your driver's license or your id they're gonna throw out your signature. So, you know, if you have a baby on your hip when you were signing it right. or, you know, some groceries signed, in your arms. I like, very frequently sign very like I'm holding something and yeah. Yeah. You're shit out of luck. Yeah. So wow. uh, they're trying they're trying everything to try and stop this from this referendum from happening because they know that the people of Atlanta do not want this thing there. Um there will be a stop work injunction filed as soon as the referendum folks turn in the signatures on the 21st. Um, but, you know, <laughs> they might try and build this thing anyway. Uh, concrete could be poured as soon as next week. So um, what we have decided, what some of us in the movement have decided to do is uh, we're, we're going to do our own stop work order. A people's stop work order, if you will. Um, so perhaps this is an announcement. There Whoa. will be more information coming soon. Is this is breaking uh, news and exclusive. Burr, 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 burr. I'm so tired. I really hope I don't fuck this up. Um, but no, I am authorized to tell you that there is going to be a large nonviolent direct action, an act of civil disobedience in the mold of the anti-nuke action from the 70s in the mold of, you know, Martin Luther King, whose legacy still looms large in Atlanta. Um, there is going to be a large nonviolent act of civil disobedience in Atlanta in mid-November. And we should have the announcement and the web, the official website for that is going to be up very soon. Um, there's also going to be a nationwide speaking tour. So a bunch of us, self-included, are going to go around to a bunch of different places where activists live and talk to them about this and, you know, help them form affinity groups and make plans to go to Atlanta in mid-November. Um, there's going to be some fun concerts and social activities to, you know, get everybody hyped up to do the thing. And uh, yeah, it's the most excited that i've been about anything in a really long time so right stay tuned stay tuned for more on that um you heard it heard it here first a little sketchy vague with the details but you know what's happening yeah, yeah. like i was like oh god should i wait should i wait to talk about it until we have the, the website but the website's gonna be up so soon so people are like just just go for it yeah just do just it. Go for it yeah so if you want to stay updated um you can look at the pre-existing websites defend the atlanta forest.org or stop cop dot city and uh i'm sure you will be able to find it from there um what else yeah we need people to come down we need endorsing groups and orgs this thing is going to be publicly promoted so it's cool we can talk about it online we could talk about it over text we can talk about it however we like because we're doing yeah. it out in the open because okay a little bit of background on this 
the movement sort of hit a wall recently where repression had gotten so bad that it was scaring people away from coming. Uh, but that in turn, you know, we had smaller numbers and we couldn't do everything we wanted to do because we didn't have the numbers um, because that made it even less safe. So sort of as a response to that, um, we're going to do a giant direct action in broad daylight with kids, with members of the clergy, you know. So if the cops were to arrest a thousand people, including children and clergy, and charge them all with domestic terrorism, um, you know, I guess they could do that if they wanted to. But it would definitely create a political crisis and uh, further delegitimize the charges that uh, people have already caught. Wow, great. Well, this is exciting news. I think and, so, too. And then finally, tell us about the show on uh, Saturday. Yeah. So another reason that I am so tired right now is because I have been working around the clock to get this very fun show ready for all of you great people to watch um, out there in Internet land. Um, it's me and my friend Jake Flores, who's a very funny comedian and podcaster. Um, we've been wanting to do something together for a really long time. We always have a good time when we go on each other's shows. So, and, and this is going to be like, not just a podcast. I wanted to do something a little more entertaining, you know, a little more, a little razzle dazzle, maybe, uh, put it online and see if anyone wants to give us money to make more of them, but it is called the woke mob and it is going to be a fun leftist comedy late night kind of show we're gonna have games we're gonna have walk on characters who say a funny thing and then leave we're gonna have a, a sketch that we just recorded today we uh, a pre-recorded sketch that i think people will enjoy but yeah this is uh sort of our collective brand of goth socialist humor and fun and hijinks um and yeah, we're called the woke mob, the woke mob because uh, obviously that's that's who we are, and all we now, do is cancel. Is it? If it's, you're oh, in time, it's, in it's, town, I mean, it's going to be at TVI in Ridgewood, which is just on the edge of Brooklyn and Queens. Um, it's my favorite venue to hang out at. Uh, it kind of reminds me of places I've been to in Austin because they have like a big patio with mm. tacos outside, um, but there's also an inside part and mm. uh, multiple rooms to chill in before and after the show. So, you know, it's fun awesome. for the whole family. Yeah. But don't worry if you can't make it there. I mean, obviously you should try everybody watching right now should just like book a flight to New York, but, um, not here, yeah. but if you can't make it there, I am spending all of my OnlyFans money to get this recorded the right way so that we can chop it up all sorts of different ways, put it online, see the reactions, and, you know, maybe uh, someone will give us money to make some more of these because, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not made of money just yet. I would love to just self-fund this entire thing, but uh, I think it'll be a good investment. And I, we have a great crew. We have some, you know, guests, TBD, <laughs> but uh, I think it's all gonna, it's all gonna work out. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jamie. Thank you for joining. And thank you everyone for coming to the show. And if you were watching live, you're in luck because you get to see this whole show. If you are watching this later and you want to see the full chat that I did with the great guests about um, Oppenheimer and nuclear war then please do become Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Again, that's patreon.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Tyler. And thank you, Phantom Fanta. And I think we're taking off next week. It's the one summer that I'm going to be off. I mean, sorry, it's the one week I'm taking off this summer of this show. So uh, we'll try to provide you with clips, though, uh, either way. And uh, yeah, keep your keep your ears peeled and your ears your eyes peeled your ears open all the appropriate orifice orders uh because we'll be uh dropping some stuff but for the regular show see you in two weeks bye everyone okay, I'm down.